Welcome to everyone who's just joining. Oh, lots of people joining. Um, feel free to use the chat box to say, to introduce yourself, say where you come from. Um, that would be great. Just trying to see my chat box. Morning everyone. So yeah, use the chat box. Let me know um, how your day is going, where you come from. Hi, Irene in London. Nice to have you here. Uh, if you want to let me know what charity you work for as well, um, or what your role is, feel free. And um, we're going to get started in just a couple of minutes. We'll just let people come on and join us. Great, just letting people say hello. Irene's an independent consultant, um, which is always interesting. Recently made redundant from Comet Relief. Sorry to hear that. Um, I'm uh, reading a book at the moment, actually, called... Uh, I can't remember what it's called. It's about another door opening when you've been made redundant by Eleanor Tweddle. And it's really interesting, actually. I'm interviewing her for my podcast next week and then she'll be on in the new year, I think. Um, but yeah, might be worth checking that book out, Irene. Welcome everyone. Do let me know, um, do say hello in the chat box, please. And um, let me know where you're from. Yeah, I'll have to, let me just look for a sec at my bookcase to find the name of it for you. Where is my book? I'm halfway to reading it. Yeah, sorry, can't remember what it's called off the top of my head. Um, but if you Google Eleanor Tweddle, then you'll be able to find it. Um, Debbie, welcome, Cornwall Air Ambulance. Very interesting charity. Hi, John. Hi, Katie. Frank Water. Some great interesting charities here that I've not worked with before. Well, lovely to see you all. I'm going to let people come on as they do. And um, if you have any tech questions, if you're struggling with sound or vision or connection or anything like that, please put it in the Q&A. Um, the Q&A only myself and Martha from the IOF can see it and Martha will sort out all your tech issues for you. Um, you can ask questions as you go along, but I'm going to take them at the end um, just so that I can focus on what I've got to share with you um, rather than have lots of different things going on all at the same time. Here we go. Uh, Martha's Googled it for us. Losing your job could be the best thing that ever happened to you. Uh, it's a really interesting book. I'm really enjoying it and recommend it. OK, so I'm going to get started now. So I'm going to close the chat so that I can focus on this at the moment. And welcome to um, this free webinar in partnership with the Institute of Fundraising, which is about boosting your authority and being brilliant at influencing. Now, you are in the right place if you experience self-doubt and a lack of confidence at times, even if the rest of the world doesn't see it, even if on the outside you look completely calm and confident, but actually you're questioning yourself inside, you're in the right place and you're also not alone. If you'd like to be taken more seriously by senior colleagues, you'd like them to really understand the value that you and your team bring to the organization. If you feel uncomfortable asserting authority and perhaps you can be a bit too nice sometimes, and if imposter syndrome is stopping you from progressing in your career. If those are the kind of things that you struggle with, I think you'll find this webinar really helpful. And I think you will also potentially find the Influence and Impact program helpful as well. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that at the end. So what you're gonna learn, the three mistakes which are probably damaging your ability to influence effectively and what I find with these mistakes is people don't realize their mistakes. In fact, people often think they're the right way to do things. Um, so hopefully that will be insightful for you. I'm going to share with you a coaching tool which will give you instant authority in challenging 
situations. Um, and then I'm going to share with you what you need to work on if you'd like to have more credibility and authority as a leader. And I thought to introduce you myself, I'd tell you a little bit about my story and how these insights changed my work life and career. So I now spend my time coaching leaders, primarily female leaders, helping them to become influential leaders within their organization without letting self-doubt stand in their way and helping them to get the rest of the organization to see the value that they and their team bring. Um, but so you might think, wow, she's a natural leader. Um, nothing could be further from the truth. My career did not start very well at all. First of all, before I was even managing people, I thought I was unmanageable because I was constantly trying to, well, I was constantly being accused of trying to walk before, trying to run before I could walk. Um, and when I became a manager, I'd had these managers that were really quite mean to me some of the time. And so I thought, well, that's what bad management looks like. So good management looks like being super nice all the time. And so when I had my first employer, I just wanted to be the best manager I could be. And to me, that meant um, just making sure she felt super supported, encouraged and praised all the time. And what I wasn't very good at was dealing with um, Poor performance and unfortunately it wasn't a great fit I also had to learn some things about recruitment um, but it wasn't a great fit and I would sit down and talk her through how her performance needed to improve and she just never seemed to really take it seriously and when it got to her probation I went to my director and said I think we should extend it and my director was like no um, if someone's not showing their best in the first uh, three or six months of the role, it's not going to get better from there. And so that day I had to fire the first person I've ever managed, um, which was awful for everyone involved. Um, and I take a huge amount of responsibility for that because I had not learned how to have authority in my role. I had zero authority. I was just being super nice all the time. So I learned some great lessons from that in terms of clarity of expectations, setting boundaries and holding people accountable to those expectations. It got a bit better. I ended up leading teams at Samaritans. I was leading a high performing team and then I was promoted above my peers, all of whom were at least five to 10 years older than me, had more experience than me. Um, but I've been promoted for reasons I'm going to share with you later on in this webinar, because I think you can learn from those as well. At first, none of them respected me at all. Um, and there were days when I actually did cry in the toilets, not that any of them would have known that. Uh, and it took me a while to work out how to earn the respect of people who had been my peers and who did not naturally respect your authority. But I started learning how to influence others. I then moved to Rainbow Trust Children's Charity as director of fundraising and marketing. Um, I was 29 years old. I looked about 20, um, thanks to good genes. Um, and when I interviewed there, the staff interviewed me as well. And they were like, she's very nice, but she's just not old enough to do this job. And then I was given the job anyway. And I would go in in the morning and say, morning. And they'd be at their desk. They'd look up and then just look down again. <laughs> it felt like they were all doing that. Um, so again, I had to work out how I could have this authority that I didn't really seem to have naturally. Six months later, brilliant team, all respected me and we um, did amazing things in terms of our performance. And in that process through working with a coach was I needed to work on developing my mindset. So leading myself, because often what was going on in my head was what was holding me back. And also I needed to develop, develop influencing skills so that I could lead others. And so, that's what I did. And some of the things I'm sharing with you now and all of the things I share in the Influence and Impact program are the things that enabled me to go from that really quite dodgy start to being chief exec of a small charity. I made a detour into recruitment, recruiting senior fundraisers and ended up as managing director of charity people for a couple of years. And now I'm a consultant and um, well, mainly I'm a coach. I've written a book called Leading Successful Fundraising Teams and I chair panels, that's a picture of me, chairing a panel with some of the sector's most interesting fundraising directors. So the reason I share that is because my entire career changed when I started to focus on working on myself as a leader and learn how to influence. And trust me, if I can do it, then you can do it too. 
So let's look at the three mistakes that could be damaging your ability to influence. Okay, so mistake number one is sticking to what made you successful. The phrase I use here is what got you here won't get you there. By which I mean, often we are promoted because um, we work super hard and we know our stuff. And the things that make you really successful before you're a manager are not the same things that will make you a successful manager. Before you're a manager, you never have to set boundaries and expectations, <clears throat> excuse me, boundaries and expectations, for example. You just ask a lot of questions. And when you're a new manager, you, sorry, when you're a manager and you're managing a team of people where you know your area better than anyone else, then I expect that you're quite used to providing all the answers for people. And in fact, you think that's doing your job well is providing all the answers because you're a specialist within your area. But when you get promoted, whether that's to head of fundraising or whether you're heading up a number of different income streams. So for me, I went from corporates to head of organizational giving. So that was statutory trusts and corporate fundraising. Suddenly you find yourself managing people who know more about their area than you do. And if you stick to the same way of doing things, which is trying to have all the answers, then you're gonna find yourself in hot water and frustrated and frustrating them very quickly. At each new level of leadership, there is a new way of operating that makes you successful. So at your first level of managing and leadership, it's very much about learning how to set those boundaries and expectations and inspire and engage people. When you move to a head off level, it's very much about learning to become more of a generalist rather than a specialist, about learning to ask the right questions rather than have all the answers. And as you go up and up and up, that becomes more and more the case. A chief exec is absolutely a generalist. They can't be a specialist in anything. They have to have the overview of everything. So ask yourself, if you're finding things challenging or frustrating, ask yourself, am I trying to do what has always worked so well for me? Because that might be the issue. Those things that have worked so well for you at your previous level may not be working effectively at this level. So look around and establish what does it mean to be successful at the level I'm operating at, whatever that level is. Mistake number two is thinking that working harder is the answer. So often when we would like more authority, when we'd like people to respect us more, we think, well, they haven't noticed how good I am. Um, they haven't noticed me. They haven't given me a promotion. I've been passed over. Um, what I need to do is just work harder because if I work harder, I'll get better results and then they'll notice me. Um, and I can understand why people think that way. I used to think that way and I would work myself into the ground. I try and be the hardest working person in my team. But, and we are, we're taught from a young age that hard work is the answer to everything. But we reach a limit to how hard we can work. And when we hit that limit, then we go into being overworked. We go into being overwhelmed, exhausted. Um, and a lot of us, are hitting that limit at the moment. A lot of us have been hitting it during what has been a very difficult year full of change for us and for the people that we're managing. And certainly as we get to the end of the year, even I, who am a Miss super positive coach person, is feeling pretty tired right now. So the important thing to remember is that hard work alone won't get you there. And the other thing that drives a lot of people is, well, if I can just get things perfect, if I never fail, if I never make a mistake, then I'll have authority, then I'll be able to influence, then I'll get noticed. But that, again, is just setting yourself up for failure because it's not possible to be perfect all the time. We actually learn as much from our failures as we do from everything else. And actually, the person who is perfect is not that enjoyable to work for. If you are a perfectionist and you are pushing yourself really hard, these really high standards, the likelihood is you are also doing that for your team. And they may not know how to meet your standards your way. And that may be demotivating for them. Plus, how many leaders that you respect are walking around looking like complete, overworked, exhausted, stress heads 
right now. And, and to be fair, this is a unique moment in time. So let me rephrase that. Generally in life, do you respect those leaders who are just really stressed, have got no headspace? You, you don't want to even go and ask them a question because you know that it's just going to stress them out. You probably don't. The successful leaders you know do not work themselves into the ground. So the reframe I'd like you to start using if this is a mistake that you're making is how I'm being is as important as what I'm doing. By which I mean, how are you showing up for your team? Because if you are showing up exhausted, stressed, trying to make time for them, but really not having the headspace, asking them questions, not really listening to what they have to answer because you just want to quickly get to the point where they know what they have to do and they go off and do it. That isn't helping you to have authority with them or with anyone else. So being able to be intentional about how you're showing up with your team, with colleagues in other departments, with people more senior than you, start to think, what impression do I want to make on them? How do I want them to think about me? Um, and even just using that as a filter will help you to show up differently. So if you have always thought hard work is the answer, that may be slightly blowing your mind or you may be really pushing back against me in your mind on that one. And I'm not saying don't work hard, I'm saying hard work alone is not gonna get you the influence you want and be careful not to work yourself into the ground in the process. And the third mistake is seeing challenges um, and seeing them as problems, basically. So, I have worked with hundreds of leaders in the charity sector, a lot in the fundraising world. Um, and one word that comes up a lot is frustrated um, because you can't get other people to understand your message or you can't get the resources that you need or you can't get this department to work with you effectively. And what happens with a lot of us is that we see those as immovable problems, or we see them as something that somebody else, it's someone else's fault, we can blame them, it's their fault that we're not able to do our job effectively. But actually, once you are leading a team, it's time to think about those situations differently. Because the brilliant thing about leading a team is you get to change things. And the more senior you become, the more ability you have to change things. But if a team member isn't performing, you get to work with them to improve that. If um, you're not working well with another department, you get to sit down with them and have a conversation about that and improve that. If you're not getting the resources you need, you get to at least ask for and make a business case for the resources that you need and make sure that the organization understands the consequences of the choices that it's making. What you don't get to do anymore as a manager is to dwell in the place where you are feeling like a victim of circumstances because it just, it doesn't empower you, it doesn't empower your team. So when I, um, when I shifted from that to what I call taking radical responsibility or being proactive, things really shifted for me. And this is a trait I saw when I was recruiting senior fundraisers and chief execs at charity people. Someone would come through the door and in the half hour we would spend together, I could tell you if they were someone who was gonna go far in their career, if I could place them anywhere and they would succeed because they did this and they gave me examples of how they did this. So what does it look like to take responsibility? Well, my examples would be, uh, my best ones are when I started doing this, which was when I was at Samaritan. So I was um, head of corporate trust and statutory at Samaritan's on a maternity leave. And we were fed up with the reporting we were getting from the finance team. Everybody was. Um, and people used to complain a bit about it all the time at fundraising team meetings. And so I said, well, would you like me to try and do something about this? I can gather everybody's um, thoughts. We can look at what we actually need from finance. And then I can go and have a meeting with them. Uh, and I did that. I had a meeting with finance. And I didn't just put forward how I saw things, I wanted to hear from them. Why did they do things in that way? How could we be working more effectively with them as a team? And we completely changed the way that we worked and we got the reporting that we needed. We were happier, they were happier. That wasn't in my job title, 
Um, I wasn't doing it because I wanted to be, to be promoted. I just was doing it because I was really sick of having the same conversation all the time. And I thought, well, I'll take responsibility for making this happen. I did the same with creating a fundraising strategy. We were just faffing around, but I wanted to go to corporates and be able to present strategies. I was pitching to Vodafone. We needed a five-year strategy. We didn't have a five-year fundraising strategy, never mind a five-year organizational strategy. So I played a role in making that happen. Um, and as a result of playing those roles, my director realized that there were things that perhaps he didn't want to do, but I was doing. And when my maternity cover came to an end, I was promoted to head of fundraising, which is the situation I referred to earlier that was quite difficult at first. And I have continued to do that. And I have continued to be promoted in the roles that I've had. And I don't do it to get more power or to be promoted I do it because when I see something that's not working I see an opportunity to fix it rather than an opportunity to get frustrated I hate being frustrated so I would encourage you to start to do that and I don't always mean take on more work sometimes it's just about being the person who asks the question you also don't have to know how to do things perfectly I didn't know huge amounts about finance I didn't know huge amounts about strategy I was just saying can I make this happen? What can I do to make this happen? And then I learned as I went along. Um, and it's also a really good idea if you're thinking of trying to develop in your career to look at the job spec above you and see if there are things in there that you can start working towards now so that when you're, if you are going to volunteer your time for things, you're doing it strategically rather than just being the person who says, yes, I'll do that to absolutely everything. Now, if you're not sure whether or not you're taking responsibility, think about the areas of your work where you are frustrated, where you're blaming someone else for the situation or you're just blaming the situation and ask yourself, if I was taking responsibility, what would I do? If I was super proactive, what would I do to improve things? So those are the three mistakes that I see a lot of people making. Now, uh, when we were talking about this webinar, I promised you the number one tool that I use to have more authority in situations and in difficult conversations. And this is it. I call it the cloak of authority. And the idea really came from uh, years ago when I was watching the Harry Potter films. Harry Potter had a cloak of invisibility. He put it on and nobody could see him. And there were times when I realized I didn't naturally have authority um, and I was going into situations where I felt quite uncomfortable um, and I was having to have quite difficult conversations so the conversation the, the one that comes to mind is there was a time I was a director of fundraising I had a team working for me and two of the people in the team really did not get on they weren't working effectively together and they weren't talking to each other they were just coming to me all the time um, and one of these people I had a really good <clears throat> working relationship with and one of them I found more challenging to work with. But they were both equally responsible for the situation. Just now drink water. I'm not used to talking this much. I usually do Zoom calls rather than webinars. Um, so they were equally responsible for the situation. And basically what I needed to do was to get them into a room and have a conversation with them, which basically said, this can't continue. At your level, you need to be talking to each other, not coming to me and like I'm a teacher in a playground. So I had to have give them quite a stern talking to basically and say this isn't acceptable behavior at this level, this is what needs to change. I did not want to have that conversation. I did not want to have that conversation with the person I got on really well with, actually occasionally saw socially outside of work. I definitely did not want to have the conversation with the person that found challenging. So I basically put on the cloak of authority, which is your job title. So your job title comes with authority as well as responsibility. And lots of us take on that responsibility, that stress and that pressure, the tasks to get things done. But not everyone, and particularly female leaders, don't take on the um, authority that comes with it. So your job title has authority to get the things that need to be done. done. I had authority in that situation to say, this isn't acceptable behavior. As a director of fundraising, to not do that would be not doing my job well. 
And I see this a lot. I see a lot of people who are avoiding those difficult conversations, the conversations they actually need to have to do their job well because they feel uncomfortable. So I would encourage you to imagine putting on your cloak of authority that is your job title for those conversations. So use it before you have a difficult conversation with a staff member who's not performing. Use it when you go into a conversation with that colleague in another department that you always find quite challenging or perhaps you feel undermines you in how they communicate to you. Use it when you're talking to your chief exec. I've used my cloak of authority to give feedback to a chief exec that their performance in a practice for a pitch wasn't up to scratch. Last thing that you want to do by choice, even though he was a really nice chief exec, but it was doing my job well to do that. So I, I put it on and I, or when I use that cloak of authority, I almost stand differently. Um, my voice is different because I'm really stepping into the authority that comes with the role. So you can use that as a tool and people that use this love this tool because it's remembering that um, you or me, Carla as a person does not want to have that conversation. Carla as a person just wants to be nice to people all the time. But actually Carla, a director or you in your role needs to have those conversations. And actually you need to have them anyway to be fair to that person and give them a chance to improve or just because it is part of your role. Okay, so that's your cloak of authority. And then I wanted to share one more thing, which is where successful leaders focus their time and attention. So this is what, um, this is my visual image of what it looks like for most overworked, overwhelmed, stressed out managers. That's you in the middle. And you, you can see that the space around you is very small. You don't have much headspace and thinking space for yourself. The space around, the bigger space, the pink space, that's your team. So in all likelihood, your team is taking up the vast majority of your time. And I think this has been um, even more so since lockdown and this new way of working because our duty of care feels so much um, bigger. We are worried about the mental health of our team. We're having to connect in with them more. And I'm not saying don't do that, um, but what I'm gonna show you in a minute is where successful leaders focus their attention. So often in this area, I see people spoon feeding their team. So their team come to them to ask them everything. Things that they could look up and find themselves, things that you have told them three or four times before because we've trained them to do that and then the space outside of that the dots that's influencing so that's how much time you're focusing on the stakeholders that uh, impact your ability to do your job well so people in other departments um your line manager your chief exec your trustees and um, to some extent your senior donors as well but this is mainly looking internally and then I've also put circumstances in there because a lot of people spend quite a lot of time and attention focused on circumstances that are beyond their control. And then that leads to worrying, which is a big issue I see with the female leaders in particular that I work with. So perhaps yours looks a bit like that. When I show this to people, the vast majority will say, yeah, that kind of looks like my, where my attention is focused. This is where successful leaders focus their attention. So they focus more of their attention on themselves. That probably sounds counterintuitive because you probably thought, well, good management and leadership looks like being constantly available to my team. But actually spoon feeding your team is not empowering them. It's not helping them to develop. And meanwhile, you're leaving all of your priorities and your work until the end of the day when you haven't got the headspace to deal with them. Successful leaders spend time focusing on their own priorities and they also focus on their own development. So I know a lot of leaders that will think a lot about their team's development and their team's training budget, but won't think about that themselves so much. And often that's because in fundraising, you know your area and perhaps you've done all the things you can do to know your specialism. But what about your development as a leader? Where are you taking time to do that? And it's very hard or people seem to find it very hard to prioritize their development as a leader but you are at the center of your team. And when you change the way you do things, that leverages change for everybody. So successful leaders spend a bit more of their headspace on themselves. 
less on their team because they're empowering their teams rather than spoon feeding them. And then I haven't managed to make the dots bigger on the outside, but they spend more time focusing on influencing because when you influence, you can get the resources that you need. You can have those conversations and deal with the issues. You can start to build a vision for your team within the organization and get people on board with that vision. You can start to create the change that you need. And they don't really focus any of their time on circumstances outside of their control. They might do risk management, they will deal with things when they come up, but they're not worrying about things that might happen in the future. They're focused on a plan and then what they can do right now. Um, and then the final thing I said that I would share with you is the things that you can work on to develop yourself as a leader, to have more authority. Um, and this is my influence and impact framework. I developed it based on the things that kept coming up in my one-to-one -one coaching sessions, um, particularly with female leaders at middle management and senior management level. So there's three areas. The first is about strengthening what I call your inner leader. So this is tackling self-doubt. This is about building your confidence. This is about overcoming that imposter syndrome, that overworking, that perfectionism. Because when you don't work on your inner leader, the likelihood is you're operating from a place of fear, that you're doing things and then you're worrying about what people will say about you, what people will think about you, whether you made a mistake. And I see this particularly in the women that I work with. I see it in about half the men I work with. I see it in 90% of the women I work with. Um, and so working on that inner leader, working out how to, to turn down the volume on your inner critic. I never promise that people will lose their inner critic altogether. Some people do seem to, um, but we can definitely turn down the volume on that inner critic voice that can be so vocal. And it is holding you back because it's, it's saying, things to make you stay safe. And staying safe is, it's really difficult to stay safe or stay like you're feeling safe and small and unnoticed and also have authority and create change. So that's the first one, strengthening your inner leader. The second one is about increasing your impact. This is about having a powerful presence. This is about developing your personal brand within your organization, how people perceive you. This is about how you think like a leader, how do successful leaders approach things? And then this is also about communicating effectively. And then the third one is about influencing for success. So advanced influencing strategies, communication tools that allow you to influence your team, your boss, your colleagues, and your board as well. So those are the things that I think everybody um, at this middle and senior management level needs to make sure that they've mastered. And we will all have one of those areas that comes more easily to us, but it's rare that I see people who have fully developed all three. And when they have, they are fantastic leaders and they are the people we look to within our organizations. And when you do those things, you can become an authentic and powerful leader because this isn't about leading in a way that feels alien to you. If you're introverted, it's not about leading like an extrovert. If you're a woman, it's not about leading in a masculine way. It's about leading in a way that is bringing your strengths to the fore, but also doing that powerfully. These things help you to lead a happy and successful team and they stop worry and self-doubt from holding you back. So if you are interested in diving deeper on those things, I'm just gonna spend a couple of minutes telling you about the Influence and Impact program, which is um, a program I run on my own. And then I now run it in partnership with the Institute of Fundraising as well. So we had our first cohort, it's just finished. We had 22 women in it from all sorts of size organizations, all sorts of job titles from director, through to manager. Generally, I would say they were at the middle management and heading towards senior management and director level. But we did have some people who were slightly newer to management and were really ambitious. And the aim is that we cover that framework with you and we make it um, specific to fundraising as well. So it's a three month virtual group coaching program. I know we have some men on the call. Unfortunately, this is just for um, women or people who identify as women. Um, so how does it work? Well, there were nine online modules that teach you that influence and impact framework. 
I just showed you. And you can do those at your own pace because what we then have is six group coaching calls. They're two hour long calls, which are focused on how you do that as a fundraising leader. Um, now the joy of group coaching is that it isn't all about me and me having all the answers. You are all learning from each other and you're bringing your own wisdom and experiences as well. In the first cohort, the first session we did, people introduced themselves and talked about why they wanted to join this program. And it was amazing. You had these women, there were 22 of them. They all seemed very impressive. Um, and none of them felt impressive. All of them were experiencing self-doubt or imposter syndrome or struggling to influence within their organization. Some of them were wondering if they were cut out for leadership at all. Some of them felt quite isolated. And even just the first session made them all feel less alone. Um, and that's one of the things I love about group coaching. So on those calls, we do coaching exercises, we do questions and answers, and you go into breakout rooms as well so that you can learn from each other and reflect together. And we have coaching hot seats. So people bring the things they're stuck with and I coach them through it. And the rest of the people on the team share their advice, the most rest of the people in the group share their advice and insights as well on whether it resonates with them. So, that's the bulk of the program. Um, and then you can ref you can keep in touch with each other as well. Um, and you can um, use those online modules for as long as you would like. Um, sorry, I was just thinking we used to have a Facebook group. Actually, it didn't really get used. So we're not gonna have a Facebook group going forward. Um, but people swap emails and keep in touch with each other that way as well. And if you want to proactively set up something, that's absolutely fine. But essentially, you are developing yourself as a person, you are doing professional development as a leader, and you're also building your network of female fundraising leaders that you can learn from and share your experience with. In terms of the online modules, just quickly show you some of these. So module one is on kicking your worry habit. Two is on ditching perfectionism, imposter syndrome and overworking. Three is on meeting your inner leader. So that wise, calm part of yourself. Four is on building your self-confidence. Five is on thinking like a leader and the mindset shifts you need to do that. Six is on mastering your influencing mindset. So this is about not getting in your own way when it comes to influencing. Seven is my six step model to influencing anyone. And then eight is advanced influencing skills. So that's about partnering with your boss, um, about the currencies of influencing, about managing senior stakeholders. And then nine is about communicating with clarity and confidence. So lots in there. And um, this is from Anna, who was on the most recent course. So I'll leave you to have a read of that. Also, I have a drink of water. And then we're going to go into questions in a sec. And then this is from Vicky, who's also done the program. These are also on the page where you can sign up. So Martha has put a link in the chat for you um, where you can find out much more information about this program and um, you'll find those case studies and testimonials there as well. And then there's some anonymous ones because these are sometimes things people don't wanna talk about, but um, at least three people on the program have used what they learned to successfully secure a big promotion, either within their own organization or elsewhere. They've said goodbye to perfectionism and overworking. And one of them sent me an email that said, I now know that I'm good enough. Um, and that means the world to me because wouldn't we all like to really fundamentally feel that we are good enough? It starts, the next cohort starts on the 25th of January. The dates are all on that page. And in terms of pricing, if you are an individual IOF member, the price is £1,197. And if you're not, it's £1,397. Okay, so I am going to turn my slides off now and look at the chat and take any questions that you have. So let me stop sharing there. So any questions uh, about the programme, about any of the points that I have raised, um, I can attempt to answer some bigger questions. It's quite hard um, on a webinar, but if there's anything else that you want to put in, please feel free. 
Oh, apparently the link isn't working. I think it's that bit at the end, Martha, the star bit. It's not hyperlinked. So um, Martha's going to put that in again so that you've got that. Um, so you can have a look at that. Has anyone heard about this program from someone who's already been on it? I'd be interested to know that. We had 22 people. We've got 25 spots in this next one. Um, and it's been a really, really interesting mix of people on the program. I'd really like to see. Oh, here we go. Give me a review. Um, can't see anyone's faces. Is it your webinar? Here we go. Here's a question. I find it hard to have a powerful presence without appearing arrogant. It feels like a fine line to tread. And how do you manage this? Great question. Um, be interesting to know if you'd had feedback saying that you appeared arrogant or if you just feel like it's arrogant, because I think the people that worry about this most are the ones who would find it really hard to be arrogant, even if they tried. But it's often about tone. So this is why it's really helpful to get intentional about the impression you want to make on people. So you want to have authority, for example, without dominating. Um, Martha, I think that's happened again. It's that little bit that says star isn't hyperlinked. It's really weird. Um, but anyone who's struggling with that, you can just copy and paste the whole thing and put it into your browser and that will work. So being intentional. So if you're worried about being arrogant, well, how do you want to be perceived? How would you like someone to describe you in that situation? Um, I think there are times when, so hang on, let me just write here what you said, your own feelings. So you've never had feedback that you're arrogant. So you, you have probably got zero chance of being arrogant. If this is something you worry about, you're not naturally going to go in that direction. And you've worked with leaders who are arrogant and they never, and you never want to appear like they have. Absolutely. So first of all, look at what, what it is they're doing that makes you think that they're arrogant. Is it that they're not listening? Is it that they think they're the only ones that are right? And um, so, and then make sure that you're not doing those things. But I think there's a way of communicating where you communicate with warmth. Communicate with warmth, communicate like you value what the other person has to say, but also communicate really grounded in the knowledge that you know what you're talking about. Um, you're not saying that you have all the answers. You're not saying that your perspective is the only perspective. Um, you can acknowledge other perspectives in the room, but you are owning your perspective as well and putting your point forward clearly. So I think look at the situations where you are worried about appearing arrogant and think intentionally about how you want to appear. If, for example, it's about your team, you're managing their your team and they're coming up with ideas and you have set a direction, you want people to stick to that, that's not saying yours is the best idea. It's not saying their ideas aren't very good. It's saying, actually, we've got our strategy and we need to not get distracted by other things. So let's park that idea and put it somewhere else. So I think, essentially, if you're worried about being arrogant, you have zero chance of being arrogant. You are probably going much to the other end of the spectrum. So just get intentional about how you want to be seen and go for, I've always gone for quietly confident. That, that's always been where I felt um, my comfort zone is, where um, I'm never the person that's talking all the time. But when I talk, people listen to what I have to say, because I do say it with a sense of authority um, and because I'm not going blah, blah, blah all the time or telling people what to do. And I think if you're a good listener, it's really hard for people to see, to, to think of you as arrogant because arrogant people do not listen. So just make sure that you are effectively listening, but also you, you want to do both. You want to give and take. You want to be effectively listening, but you also want to be effectively communicating, not watering down your points so much that people don't even really know what point you're trying to make or whether you really even believe it because you've couched it in so many ifs and maybes and sorries. So hopefully that makes sense. Anyone else got any questions? Uh, I think I have to tick answer live on that. I've not used this before. Anyone else got any questions about the program or about um, anything that we've raised here today? Anyone thinking that this might be a good fit for them? 
be happy to have a chat about that. The other thing is if you're not sure if it's a right fit for you, perhaps you're not sure about the level or the content, we can always set up a call as well. So I had a few chats with people last time who um, just weren't quite sure if they needed this or um, quite often people think they need one-to-one -one coaching and then realize that actually the things they're struggling with are the same things that a lot of people are struggling with and we address them in the program. But happy to have a chat with people about that. Um, you can either um, email the IOF about that. I'm sure there's an email address on that page um, or you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and say hi anyway. Um, Katie's saying it's a great fit, challenge budget wise. Yeah, I think it, or I was really concerned actually last, when we launched this um, basically in the summer, I did not know that we would get many people signed up, but we got 20 and then two more people signed up later as well. Um, so I think organizations are seeing that there is a need for this kind of development. Um, so I think it's definitely worth making the case to your line manager. And I think on that page, there's a PDF that you can give to your line manager to help make that case. Um, Irene saying, very interesting. Is it more focused on fundraising or more focused on leadership skills and styles? So the online content is not fundraising specific. The online content is on leadership skills, style, on influencing, impact, etc. cetera. Um, however, in the group calls, we are talking about that in a fundraising context. My background, as you know, fundraising director. So I understand many of the challenges that people are having. Um, and you're in a room with people who are experiencing the same challenges because they're all fundraisers, basically. The other thing I forgot to say is actually there's a bonus this time. So I have um, an online leadership development program called the Leadership Skills Lab. That's nine modules and um, things like managing through change, um, building your teams, leading under pressure and building your team's resilience, different leadership styles and um, delegating, coaching and motivating your team. So that's very much about managing downwards. That actually comes as a bonus when you sign up for this as well. So that is normally 497 plus VAT. And um, so you get two courses basically for the price of one with that. Um, someone else has said they're busy with the CIOF diploma, but interested for the future. Are you planning to run this at another point? Um, we don't have a date for that yet. Um, potentially, if this next cohort fills up like the first one did and goes just as well, then we will potentially run it another time next year. Um, it just really depends on how this one goes basically. Um, so yes, potentially. Any other questions? Um, if not, I think we will, so let me just put that I want to that. If not, then I will bring this to a close. Um, but I'm, I'm here to help if you do have anything that you do want to ask me. Um, and you have my undivided attention for the next few minutes. I could sing to you at this point, but I don't think I will. Okay, so uh, Kelly, thank you for a great session. Thought provoking, great. I aim to be thought provoking. I think sometimes people want strategies and, and I have shared some strategies, but often those strategies don't work if you are thinking about things the wrong way. And that's really where I focus um, a lot of the way I work is let's start with what's going on inside your head because I can give you the tools to speak stakeholders language. I can help you show up more powerfully in the room, but if you are full of self doubt um, or full of fear when it comes to that, then it's really hard to do that. So that's why I love to share all three within the framework. Great, well, if you're gonna head off do say goodbye and then do connect with me. Um, Katie, really useful, have a few actions, great. If you try the cloak of authority, anyone, um, drop me a message on LinkedIn and let me know that you have given that a try. Irene, thanks so much, glad you found it useful. Yep, lots of food for thought for you there, great. And I'll just stay on to say goodbye to you. I always feel like uh, hosting webinars a bit like hosting a party at your house. You can never be the first to go to bed. And um, so, yeah, I stay on until everybody else has uh, logged off. Um, 
we won't share the PDFs, um, but we, this will be up on the page as a recording, so you can always go back and have a look at it. Thanks, John. Thanks for attending. Thanks, Debbie. Bye, Irene. Thanks, Julie. Thanks for coming. Uh, and for those of you that are still here, feel free to connect to me on LinkedIn as well if you have any follow up questions. Um, and um, Martha has kindly put the link to my profile in there as well. Okay. Okay, Martha, do you want to um, do you want me to show you show me your face? <laughs> to say goodbye to a human person. Hello, if you stop the recording as well. Ah, oh, yes, that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs>